Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a whole new episode of Full Seam Ahead. I'm your host, Zoe, with my co-host over there, Angel. Hey, how's it going? This is episode 90 on this marvelous Monday. Unfortunately, the Astros didn't take the series against the Texas Rangers in that first Lone Star series. But hey, you live another day. There's a new week coming in with the Blue Jays. I believe we got the, the Rays as well coming soon. You know, we got to focus on that instead of the past. But other than that... We'll talk a little bit more about it in our pros and cons section. We'll look at the preview with the Blue Jays coming into town from the six. And then look around what's going around the league. Um, a lot of big things are happening, especially a sticky situation in New York in the Bronx. Um, it was very difficult to see that as a Minnesota fan. And if you're a Yankee fan, then you're like, you know, they're always arguing about the things. But before we get started on Jackie Robinson Day that just happened this past weekend, the Players Alliance showed up and supported all the african-americans i believe there are some mexican-americans as well on the field some kids you know playing baseball in high school and dusty baker went out to talk to them Corey jokes alex bregman dana brown uh it was very cool to see uh some of the player not alliance uh former baseball players were out there as well you had curtis granderson was there chuck McElroy was there and then even an astros former manager who was here for the 100 lost seasons, and that was manager Bo Porter. He managed the Astros from uh, 2013 and 2014. But he just wanted to talk about a little bit about the Players Alliance, and then he even talked about a little bit more about seeing Corey Jokes, a a local Houstonian, growing up in Friendswood, Texas, going to the University of Houston to play baseball. And he just wanted to tell the folks out there how what the Player Alliance is about and seeing Corey jokes at the next level. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to be boots on the ground. And even when you look at what the players, the players alliance is doing here today, this is what you call boots on the ground. And when you start to think about baseball and development, we can look at major league players and know that that's a really, that's a far goal for a lot of kids. It's more important the core values that they're going to develop as they pursue a career in baseball. Whether they're going to play in the major leagues or not, it's we want to basically develop you know, better men, better women, and use baseball as kind of like the tool to actually help accomplish that. So I've always been really big on community, community development and using sports as an avenue you know, to navigate that. But when you start to see kids from your inner city play at the major league level, I think it just... It inspires so many other kids because, like when I was growing up, I mean, I wanted to be a New York Yankee because Dave Winfield and Willie Randolph looked like me, and it inspired me to want to play baseball. So it's extremely important, you know, when you have success stories come out of your city that you celebrate them and that other kids are able to use that as an inspiration. I think that's pretty, fa- uh, you know, fabulous to hear from him saying things like that about being able to develop and especially, you know, not a lot of players, high school players, college players go and play at the major league level after high school, people stop and they move on with their life. The same thing with college college comes. If baseball doesn't go their route, they're over there trying to get a degree to see and pursue a better career for their lives. When you get to that minor league level, you never know if you're ever going to reach the major league level. And right now, Corey jokes is up there. I mean, he's done pretty damn good too, as well. Um, but hearing that from Bo Porter, I think it's pretty exciting, you know, for future baseball players and especially even the kids in the RBI program over there in Houston. Oh, yeah, I think the players, the, the Bo Porter Player Alliance is doing a wonderful job. Like, I feel like they're not just like helping kids develop the game um, as baseball players, for, but most like, but mostly like, like you said, like developing those values and making them, you know, become better men and women. And I feel that's the highlight of that, um, of the Players Alliance, because they're helping kids become role models and inspirations in their community and not just on the field. Yeah, another thing, too, I caught from that was, like, baseball was kind of an escape 
sport for everybody. If it wasn't baseball, I mean, there's football, you got basketball, just sports in general. You got options to do in, from gang related things to drugs to, you know, even stealing and things like that. I mean, there's always a way to develop yourself. And if you're not going to be a baseball player, maybe a front office position. You could be a scout. You could be a GM, just like Dana Brown. Dana Brown never thought he'd be a general manager. He's been up there trying to get interviews with different teams, and he's always got knocked down. But, you know, the Astros got, got with him. Jim Crane thought he saw something in him. And I think right now it's looking too, uh, so good because you still got you, – you locked down Christian Javier, and he even talked about maybe possibly locking down Kyle Tucker and Framber Valdez for the future. And then also – Jose Altuve and Alex Bregman. But that's enough for that. We just wanted to share that little insight with you about Bo Porter and his thoughts on the players' alliances and what they're trying to do and develop these athletes. So, Angel, we already talked about Jackie Robinson Day. That was a good day for the Astros. But describe this overall series. What would you say? I would say depressing. I feel the Rangers really outplayed us this series. Besides that second game, the Astros lost, and they lost – by like it wasn't close like mm -hmm. those were the biggest losses they had in the season compared to the run scored and in those two games they lost they didn't really look good martin press that like martin press from last year the movie face we talked about that uh the last podcast they really he really had our number last year and that continues on to this year and even andrew Heaney pitched good like we didn't even score a run against them. We scored a run against their bullpen. But it was kind of depressing to lose the first series of the Lone Star Series. But, I mean, there were some good things that came out. But overall, I think – I feel like it showed more how good the talented Rangers are. Like, yes, we, ex mm -hmm. we expected them to be better, but they're pretty darn good. Like, they're pretty good. Like, it, like if their pitching yeah. holds up, that offense can score some runs. Shoot, even Will Smith is looking good for them. Yeah, I think he had a – 150 ERA when they showed um, his stat line in five games. And well, now it's six after getting Alvarez out. But uh, I would say frustrating. I would think, you know, the offense had some holes. That, that Jackie Robinson game at least was probably the best game they played. And it showed because it was the only win of this series. But at the end, I mean, the Astros had tons of opportunities, tons and tons. Uh, Framber Valdez did his best to just give the Astros some comfort, try to – you know, manage some runs some type of way, but it all breaks at the seventh inning. And next thing you know, the Rangers coming up and Marcus Simeon hits that grand slam. So it, it was very frustrating. And then especially the home plate uh, umpire for both sides. I'm not even going to say for the Astros, for both sides, even for the Rangers. I mean, pitches out of the zone that's barely missing the mark, but then there's some that are not even close. And it does affect a player's mind. Luckily, I, I saw that Jake Myers at bat, and there was one ball that was way outside in that right uh, right corner. And Jake, with two strikes, had it to swing so late because he didn't know if it was going to be a strike. And it was the same exact pitching location where it was at, where it was caught. So I, I say it's frustrating. It it's baseball, especially that uh, little weak ground ball that Alvarez hits at third that Josh Jung just scooped up and touched uh, the back. But overall... I think it was pretty decent, pretty, like I said, frustrating. Pros and cons from this Ranger series. You know, instead of starting with the pros, give me the cons. I just want to get the cons out the way. And, you know, hopefully we look better in the next series. Oh, for sure. Okay, so let's start with the cons then. Luis Garcia. That's a picture we need to talk about. Three back-to-back, -back, four outings. Like, in his first outing, he pitched five innings, seven hits, three and runs, which is okay. Second outing, four innings pitch, six hits, and four earned runs. And now this one, five innings pitch, six hits, and five runs. He's 0-2 with a 7.73 ERA. But even though he didn't pitch to the expectations, Martin did mention that he did he did like what he saw from Garcia, that he thinks they're in a step in the right direction. So hopefully he can turn it around because, again, those three, those three outings weren't very good. We haven't won a Luis Garcia start as well. So, I mean, and it's kind of hard to win when you're fr starting from behind. So, and that's how we've been having it. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, too, I mean, the Astros have been going back and forth, kind of scoring early, and then there's a game that they just don't score at all. And that last game against the Rangers was just a perfect example. You know, pitchers could do so much, but at the end, too, uh, hitting has to hold off. Oh, yeah, definitely. And speaking of that, 
runners in scoring position. That is something the Astros have struggled, not just this year, but throughout the years. I feel like it's always an issue, but there's times where we like, increase those numbers by bringing in runs, but there's somewhere they just like we're offers when runners in scoring position. Like, for example, Friday night, we're 0 for 8, 7 left on base. Saturday night, 2 for 8. That's the game that we won, and we're still 2 for 8, 7 left on base. And then Sunday night, 0 for 6 with 9 left on base. Like, that's yeah. not good. That, that's not a winning mm-hmm. strategy right there. No. And I'm surprised it's 2 for 8 on Saturday night. I thought the guys were hitting the ball hard, but um, that air costly for the Rangers kind of hurt them but helped us. But, I mean, all these offers, Friday night, Sunday night, you know, goose eggs laid – Around and like I said, I mean, Valdez pitched a great outing oh, that yeah. night. Um, Garcia, on the other hand, it didn't look too promising, but Framber did look well. It just and unfortunately too with that splitter that was just left up right there when uh, Neris was pitching and Simeon just like crushed it. Yeah, that was an but, O2 count too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he just left it hanging, and you know when you give it to players like that, Simeon's a former All Star, um, and he's a Silver Slugger too. He's going to do damage with that pitch, but uh, yeah, runners in scoring position, that, that's tough to read off of. I don't think we've have set this for a good while because the Astros have been doing a decent job. And right now, I mean, from that series, and then especially with the Blue Jays coming into town, they're going to have to figure it out quickly. Oh, yeah. And then I feel like it was such a different atmosphere and different momentum from the Pittsburgh series. I feel like for the Pittsburgh series, we were hitting everything. And then we come here, play the Rangers, come back at home, and it's like our office is completely shut down. Like mm-hmm. it was, it was, it was such a different, two different series in the same week. And then our defense, this one was costly in this game. Um, Valdez pitched good, then he walked somebody, then Pena makes that error, and that just unravels that whole in, inning. Before the Rangers series, the Astros have only had three errors all season. Now they have a total of seven. Saturday, they had two errors, Dubon a throwing error, and Brown a pickoff error. And then Sunday night, two errors as well. Pena throwing error and a Abreu a bre- a fielding error. Now, I know that was a bad throw by Pena, but I think it was scoopable. I think okay. – I, I, what I think is that Abreu thought it was going to bounce off the dirt, but then he saw it bounce off the grass, and he kind of, like, panicked. They like, expected, like, a different – trajectory for the ball to go because he kind of lifted up. I don't know if he's trying to repeat. He kind of went up a little bit and like just put, left himself flat-footed to make a like to make a scoop. I think that's what kind of threw him off. Yeah, Bray's trying to improve his defense. If you go see like some of the videos out there uh, pre-game warm-up, I mean, he's the first one either hitting or he's on the field trying to get some defensive work. Of course, Astros fans are – we were spoiled with Gurriel being one of the best defensive first baseman. Yeah, go Glover as well. And now we got a new first baseman with Jose Abreu, which his defense isn't the best. And he even had said it himself that he's trying to improve. But at the same time, too, you, and I, I'm like I said, I love Yuli Gurriel with all my heart. But I mean, give Jose Abreu a chance. You know, this is just, I mean, we're what, about 16 games into the season? 17? Yeah, right. Come on, we got about, we got over 100 games left. This guy's a former MVP. Uh, silver slugger as well of course he doesn't have the go glove but when you hear a guy that's you know you you hear and you see a guy going out there before game time and even before the team gets out there you know for the you know their team batting practice he, he's showing you that he's going to do whatever it takes to be the best but like you said he probably just thought it was a short hop and and he just kind of scoop it up but you you go from three to four air I mean four errors in this series. That that's tough. That's very brutal. I mean the defense yeah. hasn't been, the defense hasn't been this bad since the White Sox series in um, on championship weekend. So yeah, yeah, I would like to say errors these two runs, and that's that was the case this time around. Well, yeah. Well, for Saturday we're lucky enough to have you know we're hitting everything going right or going the right way for us. Um, Hunter Brown pitched good and. He only, I think, what, four, three earned run. I mean, uh, runs, and then, like, he only allowed one earned run. Uh, Something like oh, that. So, Hunter Brown. Zero earned, earned runs. Zero earned runs. Okay, yeah. my fault. But, no, I was talking about the runs, which, because of those errors. So, but, yeah, I mean, the cons are bad. I think the defense is still good. It's just, I think it's just very different, too, with Altuve. I just have a feeling that if Altuve's not on the field, it's just – and even the lineup, it shows right there in the runners in scoring position. I feel like it's 
difficult to see not you know not having his presence in that lineup and on the field. I think it's more in the lineup, honestly. I feel like Dubon has done a pretty good job, you know, covering second base, like showing the range, stuff like that. And actually, he does a pretty good, like, like he's doing pretty good with the bat as well. I just feel like having a two, like I agree with you, because I feel like having a two wins, but like having a leader in that clubhouse, and like and like you're missing like your leader, like your core piece, um, and that just like. I feel like he's like the guy that brings the club together, like the glue for that clubhouse. And when he's not there, it's just kind of hard to bring that in. Like, because again, like all credit to Dubon. Like, I know you're about to mention him in a little bit. He's been pretty, pretty yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, he was. And, you know, since we're talking about that, we're going to go with the pros. I think you got to still continue to talk about Mauricio Dubon. I mean, this guy's a hitting menace in this Astros lineup right now. He's pretty much holding it down until Jose Altuve comes back. But right now he's on an 11-game hitting streak. He has a 340 batting average with a 765 OPS, which isn't bad. Uh, two RBIs as well. Lead-off spot. You know, Chaz McCormick did. And luckily, he, everything's going well for him. Uh, hopefully, we see him in today's lineup. But um, Chaz, the vision wasn't there for him. He was saying when he was playing outfield, and he had told Gary Pettis and told Dusty Baker, so they took him out as a precaution. And, well, they needed a new leadoff hitter who they go to with one of the hottest hitters in the Astros lineup right now. That's Mauricio Dubon uh, Saturday night. He went two for five and then Sunday night, he extended that hitting streak. Like I said, to 11 with one for five. So overall he went 300 in the leadoff spot. So I have a question for you and I'm not sure what you're thinking about when Chaz McCormick comes back. Do you think they leave the hot Dubon at the top of the order or do they go back to Chaz and have him as the leadoff hitter still? You know, I feel like you can in it like flip on um, both of them in that leadoff spot. But Dusty did say he was gonna leave Chaz in there until it was proven otherwise that he couldn't handle the the leadoff spot. So I say we go back to Chaz. Um, I feel like Chaz earned it. He hasn't done anything to remove himself from that spot. Like injuries happen, mm -hmm. and it's like unfair to remove like to not give a guy a chance after he got injured. So I say Chaz goes back to the leader spot, but I love Dubon in the bottom of the lineup, creates a spark because I feel like Maldonado still kind of inconsistent. So being able to have someone that you can trust to bring in those runs, say like Tucker or Hansi or Joe couldn't like do their job, someone there to pick them up. I think Dubon's that guy. I like jokes. I would like to see jokes in like, in the DH spot over Hensley. No offense to Hensley, but I feel like you give core jokes a little bit more at bats, like that Pirate Series, for instance. I mean, he was in the ball, but he was being consistently in the lineup for the back-to-back. -back. I don't know if he played the whole three, you know, the whole series against the Pirates or played two games out of the series. But, I mean, I agree. I think you leave Dubon in the bottom of the order until otherwise, like Dusty had said. Because, too, Dubon's kind of that spark in the bottom of the lineup. I mean, you have Dubon, and then either you go with Hensley in the DH or jokes in the dh or left field and then you got um martin Maldonado. so yeah i agree i think you leave him in that bottom part of the order until Chaz starts nearing to mess up hopefully it doesn't but like you said too injuries do happen my next pro hunter brown hunter brown lights out lights out back-to-back -back outings before you go to your next pro because that was a good one but uh, this question came up because you said you like jokes mm -hmm. if brantley comes back who gets demoted? Is it Myers? My, okay, that's what I was Myers. Thinking. Yeah, Myers. I think Myers does get demoted. I'd be shocked if I will. I kind of would and wouldn't be because Jokes doesn't play center field. I haven't seen Dusty put him in center yet. Yet, and that's the key word right there. I don't think I'm. You know, from the practice in the pregame when they're doing their defensive drills, uh, Jokes is always in left field. So it's kind of. You know it should be jokes, but because of the defensive okay. part of it, it could be Jake Myers staying and Corey Jokes going down. Yeah, because that's because if if we keep jokes, that's already three left fielders, which as Alvarez, Jokes, and Brandy. Yeah. So I mean, but then again, you gotta think about two. You gotta put Brandley in the DH or Alvarez in the DH. So mm -hmm. it, it kind of interacts with that. If you need a defensive sub at the end, you put Corey Jokes out there. But with Jake Myers, I think the only thing that's really going to keep him in the league is center field because you just saw – yeah, I mean, the the defense to me, I feel like he's still a little hesitant out there. That's a good – I mean, that's a good part he caught in the warning track. Yeah, he did. I'm not I – mean, you know, credit to him. But I feel like still he's still trying to get back into the groove of 
being able to lay his body out on the line still. That's how that's how I see it at least. But oh, well, my thing is, I feel like the bat gets puts you in the lineup, like forces you into the lineup. That's what right? I'm saying. You yeah. know, if jokes if jokes continues to hit and he's hitting over 300, I mean, I'd be shocked if they demoted him and yeah. uh, I mean shocked. Yeah, demoted jokes and you keep Myers in there because when you have a hot bat, I mean, you're not gonna just sit it out. And I think with with Mauricio Dubon right now, if he doesn't continue this hitting streak that he has, he'd be sitting down right now. David Hensley will at least get a game yeah. at second base. So, I mean, that's a good question, though. I would, I've never thought about it because, I mean, we had talked about it, too, I think the last podcast off air. But I would say jokes would stay and Myers would go down. But, I agree with you. Yeah, so back to it. Hunter Brown, like I said, man, is lights out. He's been lights out for the back uh, past two outings that he's out there. Shaky third inning, though, in that Rangers game, um, like I said, because of that error that had happened. But other than that, I mean, he was lights out from the whole game on. Um, you know, real quick, we'll just talk about his stat line, seven innings, five hits, two runs, zero of them earn, one walk, and five strikeouts. And then the thing about this, too, is Yainir Diaz, when he's behind the plate, they're 2-0. and So the battery right there with Diaz and Brown, has looked pretty promising. And then I saw something too with the stat when Diaz is behind the plate. The ERA, I think pitching ERA is like 150 something, I believe. I think 154. I'm not sure on the top of my head, but will we will we continue to see this Brown and Diaz combo for the next start? Do you see this happening in the next start, or do you think the Astros go with the you know go back with Maldi? I say right the wave. I say keep keep giving Diaz and Hunter Brown that that you know time together. I feel like they have a strong connection. I feel like Diaz knows what Hunter likes to throw at what time at this batter, this situation. So I see it, but let's keep it going. I mean, he hasn't shown anything that um, says otherwise. Yeah. So I think that'd be a good spot. And then Hunter Brown still hasn't allowed any home runs. And then, yeah, and that's another good yeah. stat too, right there. I, I'm shocked. Uh, seven, what, 10 starts? He's or seven or 10 starts, something like that. Hasn't allowed a long ball. So that's, and I mean, still, that's pretty good. No. It was, and we mentioned this last podcast. He still hasn't allowed any earned runs yeah. against any other team except the Tigers. Yeah, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, we won't see him till I think the next. It won't be the Blue Jays series, but the following series. Uh, I think that's Atlanta. I would say so. Yeah. It, it's. I mean, the Astros are going to have some tough competition oh, coming yeah. up. So we got that the Raves, the, the Rays, the Toronto, the Braves. Spot, and the Braves. Yeah, and the Braves. So it's going to be. I mean, I think Astros kind of thrive on tougher competition, though. But my last. Pro before we you know move on to the preview, Jeremy Pena. I think he looked pretty decent in the box. I mean, he did have some strikeouts in some games, but three for ten. That obviously that's a three hundred batting average. Uh, doubled a walk, two RBIs, and three stolen bases from this series. So I feel like he's starting to you know step by step, you know baby steps here and there. But I think that's a positive outing to see that you're getting your ALCS slash world series MVP back on track. And I don't think if he, if he does stay hot, I don't think he goes back into the top of the order. I think he's just going to stay right there in that mid, which I'm, I'm cool with because you got David Hensley. I'm not David Hensley, uh, Kyle Tucker in front of you. And then you have Mauricio Dubon, who's right now the Astros hottest hitter. So I think that's pretty good to see, but that is the recap. That's our pros and cons from this series. And let's move on already to the preview. We're going to see Drake and the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, they're 10 and 6. Blue Jays broke that Rays winning streak. I don't know if you caught that yeah. out there. And then also handed their first series loss as well. So that's kind of two back to back little nodders for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. But Astros were 2 and 4 last year against the Toronto Blue Jays. So that doesn't seem promising at all. But Monday, today, 710 uh, start time. You got Christian Javier on the bump, 1 0 with a 424 ERA versus Kevin Gossman. He's 1 and 1 with a 1 3 5 ERA. Uh, I, I think this is going to be a good matchup. Gossman is their top guy in the order. Um, well, yeah, in the rotation. I think he's number one or number two, but I'm pretty sure he's number one. Uh, think, Javier's, go ahead. I think Manoa's number one. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Then Kevin Gossman is the number two guy, which yeah. I mean, shoot. I mean, that one, two punch right there, yeah, but it's pretty good Alec Man- yeah. Alec Manoa has been struggling though. This start of the season, which is 
very brutal for fantasy baseball guys like me because I have him <laughs> on rotation. Um, anyway, Javier's last outing against Pittsburgh, six innings pitch, five hits, four and runs, no, uh, one walk, three strikeouts. I, I got to see that strikeout rate again, dude. Yeah. Uh, he hasn't had a high strikeout That's game. That's surprising this season. Yeah, I mean, it, it hasn't shown. Um, I think the second outing in this season, he had two. In this past game, he had three. The first game of the season for him, he had seven. So I, I got to see this, you know, K rate go up from him because we haven't seen a lot of these batters nudge at his slider or, of course, that fastball too, that high riser that he throws. I mean, it's pretty significant against these batters. But right now, I mean, the opposing team looks better at the plate when he is pitching. And then Kevin Gossman, on the other hand, he looks lights out. I mean, his last night against Detroit, eight innings pitch, five hits. I mean, three earned runs. It's going to happen. No walks, 11 strikeouts, 11. So he right now he has the high strikeout rate. And then his last outing versus Houston last year, seven innings pitch, six hits, two earned runs, no walks, 10 strikeouts. So when I read you that stat line, did you catch anything, catch anything that this guy is showing that the Astros are going to have to, you know, have when they come up to the plate? I would say be aggressive. Like, no walks is really surprising. I feel like mm-hmm. he's going to put pitches in the strike zone and just put, get good hits off of that. Like, I feel he's going to come and attack you. So I feel like maybe being kind of aggressive in the first few at-bats, you know, try to um, cheat early on a fastball or, like, try to hit the fastball because, like, he has, great, he has good stuff. So I, I feel like if we're aggressive at first, it goes a good chance to get some – put some pressure on him. Yeah, and speaking of stuff, like I was going to say – this guy has one of the na- uh, nastiest split fingers I've seen. I mean, this guy's, I mean, the drop off of it is so disgusting. Um, it's his second best pitch. Being the fastball, being the first, that second best pitch is his put out pitch. And that's, I mean, that's shown this season, 17 strikeouts with that pitch of the split finger. And like I was saying, like you said too, he has a low walk rate percentage at 38 so, I mean, it's going to be very important for these guys to lay off that split finger and have good plate discipline at the plate. And, yeah, like you said, you got they got to cheat on a fastball some way, somehow, because if they don't and they're in an 0-2 count, you're going to see a lot of dosage of that split finger, and the break off of that pitch is pretty good. I mean, it shows um, low low middle, low right uh, outside. So. And even very important strikes too. So it's not just to mm-hmm. get like a chase pitch. Like he, he can, he can command it for sure. Yeah. So it's going to be very important for these guys to be aware of the fastball and split finger. Then you got Tuesday, seven ten central time. Like I said before for Monday, Jose or is on the bump for your Astros one Oh with a two thirty five ERA versus it, which we have seen a lot of Chris Bassett with his time with the Oakland athletics one, two, seven, six, three ERA though. That doesn't sound promising. Bassett's last outing event uh, against Detroit, six innings pitch, four hits, two earned runs, three walks, seven strikeouts. His last uh, two outings, he's allowed two earned runs. But like I said, we've seen a lot of him during his days with the Oakland Athletics. We haven't seen him since 2021. And that because of that trade happening in 22 when they traded him to the Mets. So this guy relies on eight pitches oh, eight. Wow. eight i mean we i thought Wait. six was bad well the this catcher has how many fingers I'm i wonder what he does with the signs pitch com doesn't even know what to do at that point but i'm gonna just read it real quick through the list he has a sinker a curveball a cutter a changeup a sweeper a slider a four seam fastball and a split finger as well but he's only thrown that two times you know only two pitches out of this season heavenly is going to be working on the sinker and the curve Sinker's about 91, 92. Likes to throw it inside to the right-handed batters, of course. If you're going to throw it in, you're je- you're looking to jam these guys like a Pena, a Brayu, a Dubon. You're, you're looking to jam these guys inside and hopefully for, you know, weak and soft contact. So you're going to see a lot of dosage of that. And then his curveball and cutter and changeup, I mean, it's kind of the same. But most heavily, any other pitch you're going to see, it's going to be the sinker. He throws that a lot of the times. And then you got on the other uh, other end, you got Jose Arquiti. Arquiti's look good. I mean, his last outing, scoreless. Six innings pitch, two hits. No one runs, three walks, two strikeouts. You usually see the changeup a lot. You know, if we're talking about last year's stats, you're seeing that fastball and changeup combo. This year, it's the sweeper. That new pitch that I remember the first game going to when, uh, when we saw him. You look at the, the scoreboard and usually tells you 
you know, how fast it was and what pitch it was. There was nothing with it when her kitty was pitching and we we're trying to figure out, well, you know, <laughs> what kind of pitch is this? Is this yeah. a slider? Is this the new sinker he's working with? It's actually a sweeper. And he's thrown that pitch the second best. I mean, his fastball is still there, but the second best pitch he has is a sweeper. Um, uses it most of the time compared to his curveball and changeup. 42.6 whiff rate against these batters. So that's a that's a good sign um, compared to his fastball, changeup, and curveball. 42.6 whiff rate if he's going to throw that sweeper. So it's going to be very important for that pitch to work for him because if not, I don't know if he's going to be able – I don't know if he's still comfortable – throw in the sinker because he just learned that pitch this past season. But, I mean, what do you think about it? I feel like he's just adjusting. Like you said, I feel like he relied mostly on his fastball and changeup. And other teams were, like, catching on to that. So they were, like, you know, leaning towards one pitch. But I think the sweeper has been very beneficial. I say I agree with you. We might not see the sinker early on, but maybe midseason it'll be interesting to see if he starts throwing it more often. But yeah. I, really, I really like that pitch. Like, I feel like it starts right down the middle and then breaks out. So, like, it, it gets those guys antsy. Like, they think it's a meatball, and then by the time they swing, they're swinging and missing. So, I really like that pitch. Yeah, I mean, he looks comfortable throwing that pitch, too. And whatever works for you, just keep doing it. I mean, it's shown. And, and look at the ERA and just his pass out. And 235 ERA, he has a win under his belt already. And then a scoreless game when he pitched. I mean, if it ain't break <laughs> – what is that saying? If it ain't broke, don't fix – yeah. yeah, there you go. So, yeah, basically just keep it like that. And then final game on Wednesday, 7-10 start time. Luis Garcia 0-2 with a 7-7-1 ERA like we were mentioning. And then you got Jose Barrios 1-2 with a 7-9-8 ERA. So, somewhere's due in this pitching, uh, yeah. this line right here. You got Hopefully Garcia. it's Garcia. <laughs> exactly, because that's what we need. A 7-7-1 Garcia going against a 7-98 Barrio. So we're going to need Garcia to – we're going to need him to improve, man, because I'm. You we've already seen Valdez look good. We've already seen a positive outing from uh, Javier. Arquiti looks good. Hunter Brown, his last two starts. The only one that's not there yet is Luis Garcia. And his, I would argue I mean, Javier, too. I mean, well, Javier had one good game. That's what I'm saying. Okay. He had uh, Garcia has yet to have one good game. So I think this. I mean, this is a perfect opportunity against Jose Barrios. On the other hand, that gives up a lot of runs. But at the same time, too, we'll talk about this Blue Jays lineup in a minute. You're gonna have to pitch excellent, just like how you pitched in that um, ALCS what, game six or game five of 2021. No, not 21. Yeah, 2021. Uh, I mean, it's gonna be very important for him. And real quick, last outing, we've already mentioned five innings, six hits, five earned runs, two walks, seven strikeouts. The seven strikeouts is a positive sign, but the non-positive sign here is his he's bottom 4% of the league with a 113.4 max exit velocity. That means players that are, you know, the opposing batters swinging the bat, it's almost an average of 113.4. And when I hear that, I think of Jorge Soler <laughs> handing that ball out of the stadium, even though that was in 2021. But, I mean, that's not a positive, you know, stat to see if you're yeah. Luis Garcia. Yeah, what, ta- like what that tells me is that he's not fooling anybody, like, and that he's mm-hmm. leaving the balls, like, the, like his balls, like, right there, like, in the plate so they can hit it. Like, so that's something they need to improve. Like, I feel like he's not hitting his spots, like, basically. Yeah, it doesn't get better with the other guy on the other side. <laughs> and Barrios, I mean, his last outing was a good outing for him, not compared to Luis Garcia. Uh, five innings pitch, four hits, one earned run, no walks, six strikeouts. And that was the first game of that Tampa Bay series. So you see that. But then I'm going to read off the last two outings that he had before the Tampa Bay game. Nine, nine and two-thirds. Innings, and this is combined. Nine and two-thirds inning pitch, 12 earned runs, three walks, 12 strikeouts that doesn't sound pretty either um but the positive sign for him on his end in the three outings against houston he's 2-0 and with a 203 era only allowed four runs 17 strikeouts and when i think of jose barrios i think of that game in the wild card in 2020 the astros looked decent against him but that's 2020 we don't have carlos correa no more uh, Michael Brantley had a good game out of that, out of that game from um, the wild card in 2020. Yeah, I think it's just going to be very important for these guys to just sit back and have great play discipline. Um, good thing too for the Astros. I mean, you have hard hitters like Jordan Alvarez, 
Kyle Tucker, Jose Abreu still has some decent pop. Um, Jeremy Pena could still hit the ball pretty well. Mauricio Dubon's hitting it pretty good, even though it's soft contact. He does have occasional way of hitting the ball hard. And Jose, Bar- uh, Jose Barrios, the seventh percentile of the league in hard hit percentage is 54.5. And that's pretty good if you're an Astros hitter because that that's very positive. I mean, you want to hit the ball hard. You've got to find a way to get on too. And if he's just throwing the ball nine in the right zone, and if he's throwing a me ball, like you're saying too, the Astros have a good chance of putting the Crawford boxes in the gap, which I mean, they struggled a lot too this series. I mean, that's positive sign to see from the Astros. Oh yeah. And they would have to have their a game. To, like, the, like the, the pitchers would, would definitely have to be their a game. Cause again, the blue Jays are a good team. I have them seventh in my power ranking. I have them winning the AO East. And just let me talk to you about some hot hitters that are that the Blue Jays are have right now. Bo Bichette is leading the charge. He has a 375 batting average, 400 on base percentage, 500 slugging. Leads the team with four home runs. Leads the AO with 27 hits. Like that's pretty good. I feel like there was always criticism against Bo Bichette because he has that like long swing came for power. But I think, I mean, he doesn't have to hit home runs to be productive. Like he mm-hmm. gets on base, steals bases, and he's, he's pretty good for them. And then we all know Vladimir, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. We all know his pop, what he has. He's, he, he's hitting 387. He's tied for second in the AO with 24 hits. And his um, teammate Chapman is who he's tied with. And speaking of Chapman, 421. He's on fire. God, 421. 421. My God, batting average. In his last seven games, he's 10 for 26 with three home runs, eight RBIs, and five walks. He's looking like the Chapman I was in the A's. And yeah, that's the what I was thinking he about got right traded. now. Yeah, he actually leads the AO in batting average and on base percentage, tennis plus slugging. He's tied for fourth in the AO with 15 RBIs. Like, Damn. that's their. That's basically their one through four hitters. And Alejandro Kirk hasn't been fine, um, has been starting off slow. Espinosa has like, been starting off slow, but hopefully they don't get hot when, when they come to Houston. Like, I feel like if we can control yeah. those three guys and Springer, we should have a pretty good series. I was about to say, you're about to forget Springer. And I, you know, real quick to mention that past series against the Rangers, they did the Astros did really good against Ardolis Garcia. Ardolis Garcia only got one home run. And I mean, after that, after that game, I don't think he even got a hit from uh, Friday night's game. So I think that was very important, but the supporting cast of the Rangers had helped them. But I mean, George Springer too. I, he loves I love, Park. He, I mean, who doesn't love Minute Maid Park? Georgie, Georgie loves it here. And, but like you were saying, Boba Chef, Vladdy Jr., Matt Chapman. I mean, I think that's, that's two through four right there. Uh, yeah. Springer is their leadoff hitter. Bo second, Vladdy third, Chapman fourth. I mean, God bless. Like you were saying, if they can control that, side of the order and if Alejandro Kirk doesn't get to a hot start or same thing as Santiago, uh, Santiago Espinal well I mean we'll it look pretty good this series so you know go ahead we got to go ahead and talk about the offensive pitching MVP and our hot takes so yeah this, lead it off right here this is one of my favorite segments you know because we want these guys to do good and you know us trying to read the future trying to give these guys some you know good luck going into the next series so <laughs> last week I had Bregman, Hunter Brown, and the Astros offense rocks Martin Perez. I'm one out of three. Hunter Brown had a great outing. Astros did not rock Martin Perez. He had our number that game. And then yeah. Bregman had a pretty good um, series. Could have been better. Mm-hmm. Zo had Tucker, Presley, and Dubon. Hits his first home run of the season. I think he went. I think I went, I think I oh, went over three. three. Yeah. Because yeah, Tucker really didn't do that much. He had a decent game his the second game of the series but after that i mean i that's the first time i'm 0 three i should not even gone with presley <laughs> i had full confidence that the astros were gonna win two out of this and yeah so oh, I, I did too i did too not gonna lie. Yeah. oh here's our new picks i have jeremy pena i mean i like what i saw in his last game he, he, he got on base still three bases if he does that against the blue jays i see him as my offensive mvp you know what? I'm taking a gamble on this one. I have Luis Garcia as my pitching MVP. I don't know. Something I feel like I have trust in Martin Maldonado. And if he said yeah. they have some good signs, 
even though he did allow five runs, I'm going with it because I feel like you know he was mic'd up today just to give you know players and kids some rep- like I thought that offer, was cool offer some representation and just like mm-hmm. to see what it takes to be a major league catcher and what mindset you know basically showing off that baseball IQ and I trust that if he says they saw some good signs I'm going with Luis Garcia as my pitching MVP and my hot take I don't know the Blue Jays are good again I ranked them seventh in my power rankings. I say Astros win this series. If our pitching holds up, that's my hot take. What a hot take because, I mean, <laughs> I hope that too. But, I mean, let me go with my – I think Dubon stays hot, and I'm going to go with him as my offensive MVP. 11-game um, hitting streak, I feel like he could push it at least to 13 or 12, maybe 14, hopefully. I would like that. I think the Duboniacs will like that too. So, I, I think he'll stay hot. He's, I mean, he's hit pretty good the last seven games. Christian Javier, I'm going with the starting pitcher like on it. this one. Uh, I need to see some swing and whiff rates on sliders, fastballs, whatever you could throw out there. I need that Javier back from last year. I need to see him striking out these Blue Jay hitters because you're going to have a lot of right-handed guys. You got Chapman, you got Vladdy, you got Bo. It's a right-handed heavy lineup, I would say. I think Dalton Varsho is the only switch hitter. But other than that, or, um, uh, yeah. yeah, I think he is. Because I'm trying to think of Santiago, uh, Santiago Espinal was. Second base. Uh, oh. No, 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 the no, batting. He's a lefty, I think. Lefty, right. Okay. So, yeah, right-handed heavy lineup still. I think that fastball and slider work is going to help him out this game. And then my final and hot take. And this is not even an Astros hot take. It's a former I'm... Astros hot take. <laughs> Springer's going to hit a home run. Springer is going to hit a home run at Minute Maid Park. There is no way he comes back to Houston and doesn't hit one at least because I think the last time he was in Houston, he had a home run as well. So Springer so, Dinger's going around then. Yeah, I was I was tempting to say lead off Springer Dinger, but I was like, nah. that's pushing it right there. That's pushing. That, that's put. That's a little pushing, like you're saying. But I think he'll, of course, you know, when you know this ballpark like George Springer has, I think he's gonna crush one, possibly to the train tracks. Hopefully, it could it's with the, hopefully it's with the Astros winning by ten, and <laughs> and, and with a position player pitching, just put it on the mound, and Springer gets one, you know, because we're winning that series. But moving on to around the league, there's some sticky, there's a sticky situation in New York. You know, I don't want, I don't want to say anything about the Yankees right now, but you know, <laughs> it ain't anything new. The New York Yankees starting pitcher Domingo Herman. Umpire um, has some foreign substance in his hand, and if you look closely in the replays, the umpire tells them to wash it off, and then mm-hmm. they check him again. They feed it again, and then it's followed by I. T- the umpire says, "I told you to wash, wash it wash off." Wash it off. And I don't know if I'm Rocco Badelli, I agree with him one percent. He was actually ejected for arguing. That Herman shouldn't even be in the game, like because mm-hmm. the rule says if you're caught with foreign substance, that's an automatic ejection from the game. Mm-hmm. And I don't see why this was not this rule was not like done put like, into place in yeah, that game. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why was it not executed? Because if he has something sticky, if the umpire tells you to wash it off, that's a red flag right there. Yeah, that's, that's something that's supposed to be there. And then again, they check him again and still has it. That's I don't. That, that's not a good look for baseball, honestly. It's not a good look for baseball. It's not a good look for the umpires either. I mean, there's a lot of <laughs> – just for instance, we are just talking about this game, the last game of the series. I mean, this home plate umpire was everywhere for both teams. But when you have an umpire saying wash it off and then followed by saying the next inning, I told you to wash it off, what's the point of having this yeah. rule in place? Well, what's yeah. the point? I mean, then – I think Aaron Boone had said he has a rosin bag that's inside the dugout and he only put like, you know, he only does it in there. No, there, there should be no exception exactly. because the rosin bag should be on the mound. It should be like COVID when the rosin bag was on the mound during COVID the starting pitcher, whoever, you know, whoever was pitching had their rosin bag and they would take it with him and take it to the dugout. That should be the same yeah. thing here and taking it out, you know, onto the mound. There's, there's no, because if you look after that inning, the like all his spin rates from his from the fastball to the curveball and all them other uh, off speed pitches, they went down. Everything went down. And, and even had a career strikeouts. Like career and career strikeout, strikeout, double digits, I think, too. Mm-hmm. 
his last two outings, I mean, they were just poor. If you look, if you go back to the game logs and see yeah. them two outings he had, it was bad. It they was... were terrible because I was even looking at him as a pickup for my fantasy because I was down. It's like, you know what? I need some pitching. <laughs> so I looked at him and I was like, whoa, like, this guy's not that good right now. So I, oh I, I pick God. it up. But yeah. I... Uh, he could have gave you the insight that he was going to use the rosin back to I know help he him. But I, I was watching that game, though, with the Yankees. And when Rocco Baldelli came out, I, I, I figured he was going to get thrown out because there should be no exception. Yeah. And Baldelli did, I think, you know, in my opinion, he did a good job standing up. Not just for the twins, but I think for baseball to sh- you know to basically tell them, hey, if we're implementing this rule, let's stay with it and not let's go off topic and just let it just you know slide. There's no reason to let you basically you already let it slide the first time. Why are you letting it slide again? And you're going to continue to let them pitch. So, and I feel like this goes back to like a deeper, um, like a deeper trend that we're seeing. Like I feel like the baseball, like loves the Yankees so much like Aaron Judge I mean there's the yeah. high marketed team out there and then Aaron Judge was giving like light well this claims that they were giving like lighter baseball so, so yeah, you can home runs like so you can get those 62 home runs and then now like they're not ejecting a Yankee pitcher for having foreign substance on like and then even when you grab dirt when you grab the rods and back you're supposed to wipe it off on your pants like, like like you just can't you know grab it and grab the ball like like the empire makes you wipe it off and they'll tell you something and I don't know. That's just kind of weird. Not being biased on the Yankees, though. I mean, yeah, I mean it's just, I it's think just, that's just, you know, my, it's just, it's just my opinion. No, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Like, obviously, like, this is a national podcast, and there's not, like, a strong relationship between Yankees and Astros. But I mean, right now we're talking about baseball. And, you know, like how you're saying, if, 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 if there's these rules set in place, we need to obligate, you know, we need to stay, with, these, stay with them. Yeah. Don't make any exceptions. Mm-hmm. But, you know, moving on from that, Tampa Bay does make history. Tampa Bay mm-hmm. tied a major league record starting the season 13 and 0. So that ties. I forgot what years I mentioned in the last podcast, but I know it was the the Braves and the Brewers. I'm not too. Uh, I don't remember the years, but <laughs> it was a long time ago, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Blue Jays unfortunately ended that streak, and I want to apologize to all the Tampa, all the Tampa, Tampa Bay Rays fans if they're out there listening. I did jinx that. I said that they were going to be 14 and 0. So my apologies. So I think he did a good job for Astros fans, I would say. <laughs> and the rest of the AO East. <laughs> yeah, because they actually lost that series. How you mentioned earlier, like they lost the, they lost their first game and then Toronto took two out of three. Now, my question to you is the Rays were playing against the A's, Boston, and I forgot the other team, but they weren't so good. Do you think the Rays are legit after this? After we, what we've seen with this Toronto series, once they played a good over 500 team, I think they're legit. I I have them on my wild card um, with the Yankees winning the division, but they got the pitching, they got the bullpen. I mean, hitting right now is looking pretty good. If this continues, there's a possibility that at the trade deadline they're going to be heavily attacking either a strong hitter or a strong pitcher because Tyler Glasnow. I don't even I don't think Glasnow's pitching right now. Unfortunately for them, though, Jeffrey Springs yeah, got hurt. I don't know if you saw that video of him uh, coming off the mound. I mean, it looked it looked very very nasty. I think that he's sidelined for two months, so that that's very brutal for their starting rotation. But they got Shane Bass that could come up and still do good. I mean, they have a lot of pitching depth, and I think just like the Astros, if the pitching depth is there for them, they're going to be a good team. And you know, carrying on from the Summer Classic to all the way to the postseason in the fall. Yeah, I would say pitching was championship. So I agree with you because, you know, there's days when the offense is off, just like what we've seen today with the Astros. But if, if your pitching's there, it'd be pretty good. And like, I feel like that keeps you in games a lot. Um, Fernando Tatis, do you remember that name? I know we haven't seen him much because he's been yeah. suspended. Um, but he's Which on is fire. crazy, too, real quick with the suspension mm-hmm. part. I mean, he's still playing baseball. I know, which I don't think that makes sense, right? Because. Yeah, like you suspended for major league baseball games, but I feel like you should be suspended. He's still getting work in minor league. Know, it's like, like basically practice. Basically, right? I I don't agree with that rule. I feel like if they're suspended, it'd be suspended completely. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's putting up some numbers in AAA. He's he's making triple A's pitcher second guess their career path. He is ten for twelve with six home runs in, in his last three games. And he's just he's expected to be back 
April 20th after suspension is over. Right now, the Padres sit in third place in the AO. I'm sorry, in the NOS with the Diamondbacks in first, Dodgers in second, and then the Padres. How significant is Tati's back, like being back with the like Padres? Like, how do you see them um, moving forward? I think it's a boost. I feel like if he's hitting this good in Triple A, it's just gonna make that wind up more scarier. I mean, you already got Xander Bogarts, you got Juan Soto, Manny Machado. <laughs> I mean, do I have to continue on yeah. listing more good players? Uh, Cronenworth's an All Star too. It just makes that lineup stronger. And even though the pitching has, I mean, the pitching hasn't been the best. If you have the offense that could, could replace that, I mean, that'd be better. But at the same time, too, Juan Soto isn't doing that very good. I He's think Manny like Machado, too. Yeah, Manny Machado's struggling at the play. Jay Cronenworth as well. So if these guys can't really get it going now. And then when you bring Tatis up, maybe that changes because he's hitting the ball with Aaron El Paso. And he's bringing the offense with him to San Diego. And it's going to look like, what was it, 2020 or 2021 Slam Diego. So it, I think it just makes their offense more scarier, I'd say. Yeah, I wonder how that clubhouse is going to be. Because I remember last year, like, they were like kind of like talking down on on, uh, on Fernando Tatis, you know, saying that he was like mm-hmm. a team player. So I wonder how that will mix up in there. But, you know, as of – this past series and week, the AO standings are the Rangers are in first place still, Seattle in second, Astros in third, Angels in Oakland. I feel like the the standings are kind of looking like how they how we expected, where Astros, Seattle, and Rangers are going to be battling for that top spot, and then the Angels in Oakland battling for the for for not being last, right? <laughs> um, but obviously, that's not where we want the Astros to be in third place. We want them to be first. Obviously, right? So, mm-hmm. I mean, how do you think they those standings like look doing for like moving forward? I mean, it's fair right now. Like I've said before, I'll continue to say it again. This Astros organization always starts off slow in the beginning of the season, always, and especially when you don't got your bats like Altuve and Brantley. Uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fine where the Astros are right now. Uh, Rangers aren't going to be there that long. I think they'll probably be third or oh, second. Wow. But I think Seattle is going to take over that second spot. I still think the West runs through the Astros. The AL still runs through the Astros as well. But, I mean, right now how the standings look, I'm I'm pretty – I mean, it looks right to me. At, at least for Seattle, it would be up there over the Rangers. I think that's the only part for me. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason to panic yet. Like, I feel no. like we're always slow starters. This is like a, trend, like a trend we've seen from not just like last year, but – a few years already where we're just like like just be patiently and get in our rhythm and now at least if we're like three games like I feel like in mid-June July we're still in third place but if we're like three four games back I still feel like we're we're in a good spot now I'll be worried if it's June July we're like 12 13 games back and that's Mm -hmm. when we're concerned but if we're like um, six games or less back from first or even second place I feel like we're, I feel like we're in a good spot. Like I feel like that yeah. experience mean like holds holds value, and I feel like mm-hmm. the Astros have that. Yeah, I don't think there's any worriness, panicking, anything like that because this team knows who it is, their identity. They know, you know, they've been to the World Series, they've been to so many consecutive ALCSs and all this other stuff like that. Postseason experience. I mean, these guys have been there, done that, and it's just gonna take a while. Like I said. You got your play, your two players on the IL right now, including another starting pitcher in McCullers, which he, he should be throwing. I think he's throwing right now and just not oh, off yeah. speed pitches yet. So, just a little update on that. Oh, and but Brandy's also um, hitting. He's uh, he's, he's seeing life hitting now too. So he's not just yeah. So, pitches, so that's good. Too. The the target on Brandy's May. I was hoping mid April or at least the end of April, but now it's May. Uh, but like we said before, don't don't rush this guy back because he's going to be a crucial part of this batting lineup at the second hole. I, I think he's going to be probably in the two hole whenever he comes back because it'll give Bregman some breathing room. Yeah. It, it just makes everybody in that lineup a little bit more comfortable at the plate. I'd say because you have somebody and better as well. But before we go, we got to rate this guy. We oh, got to yeah. rate this guy. And I mean, Framber Valdez's first bobblehead. I don't know if y'all were able to get it on I Friday like it. night, 
20 oh god i can't even get the camera going 25 consecutive quality starts it reads in the back on this plate um i mean it looks exactly like him the hair in the back too just looks pretty damn good that's the bobblehead that i really wanted this year and i really like it like luckily i was able to get For everybody it. <laughs> if that hasn't seen it i mean i'm giving you a uh, man, I suck. I can't even get this. Get right <laughs> this there. Represents... Okay, right there. Voila. Right there. Framber Valdez's first bobblehead. The quality start. Give me a rating real quick on this bobblehead. I think this is probably one of the coolest ones so far ten. this season. Ten. Ooh, I give it a ten. ten. Man, that's the one. Out of all the promotions, that's the one I really like. It. And the box is cool. I, the box. Right now. The box I think is that really cool. is so cool. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could bring it in a little bit. It shows the the... The games that he had to call his uh, starts, he had consecutively. And there's some good teams in there. It was the Mets, yeah. Yankees, Angels. Yeah, you got you got Texas, Toronto, um, New York, both uh, New York teams. You got the, of course, the Angels, Seattle Mariners. We already know how they are. Minnesota. I, I think this is a ten overall. I think this put made it even more extra special i'd say yeah i think so it gives the now, whole quality star tour my closest second bubble hit the one i really like is the golden glove tucker one where he's like making the play on the fence i think that one's really yes cool too. if you haven't seen we posted a promotional calendar for may and that one of that one the one angel's talking about god I can't even talk um he's talking about is kyle tucker go glove bobblehead i the base is a gold um he's jumping off jumping into the wall and robbing a home run With a I, it looks yeah it looks really nice um very excited to see more promotions come out yeah uh the dusty baker sunglasses i didn't get any i thought it looks nice and because you know <laughs> dusty baker does wear sunglasses i think it would have been a, you know pretty cool if they would have gave in some toothpicks with it since he always has a toothpick in his mouth use toothpicks <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know about that one. But <laughs> that is all for today's show. Continue to follow us at Full Seam Ahead on Twitter, on TikTok as well. We're on there. YouTube, subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment on there how we're doing. And then follow us on our podcast platforms. You got Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. If you've seen, we did a ticket giveaway. And that was one of the things we wanted to have was a rating of us on our podcast and you know a review give us a review we're hoping we are giving you the best astros content out there not just astros but we're giving some baseball insight we're talking about like today we're talking about the yankees uh sticky situation fernando tatis is starting to get back into form to play in the majors so we're just giving you all this insight we're hoping we're doing a good job at it because we want to give you the best astros baseball content out there but other than that we already announced our winner on today's when we have, haven't announced it on the show, but on Twitter, we have announced our winner. Uh, congrats to you, James Ness. You are the winner of the tickets. Hopefully, you have a good time at the ball game to see George Springer and the Blue Jays. Hopefully, like you said, lose a series. But that is all for today's show. Andrew, you got anything before we uh, sign off? No, thank you for listening. Thank you for giving us, you know, time out of your busy schedule to hear us. So, peace. Yeah, long show, but we appreciate your time. Have a marvelous Monday. Hopefully, we come back on our next episode and talk about a winning series. Stay safe out there, guys, and go Strokes. <laughs>